Hi friends, most of you watch my channel without subscribing. Please subscribe if you like my stories. Have a good rest. Story 1. I'm in such a huge mess that I feel so embarrassed to even admit my situation. With embarrassment I mean core humiliation. Yeah, how else do I say that? My wife of six years, Jenny, is cheating on me with my stepdad, Frank. Yes, my wife had sex with my mother's husband. I'm 37-year-old Kyle, married for six years to 37-year-old Jenny. Our relationship has been very normal with our share of ups and downs. The downs were mostly because my wife felt I was too attached to my mom. Yeah, she called me mama's boy. Now, I'm not going to defend that because my mom is no longer alive. She passed away two years back. I'm glad that I was able to love her the way she deserved. She single-handedly raised me and given me the best of everything she could and beyond her means. My mom was a single parent to me until nine years ago, until she met Frank. Frank was a divorcee in his early 45s when he married mom. I don't know what my mom saw in Frank, that she married him after being single for two decades. Frank was non-existent to me when mom was here. I used to visit her twice a week, but my conversation with Frank didn't go beyond formal greetings and a smile. I don't know why I was just not able to accept him as a father figure, but I never showed this to Mom. I was happy that she got a companion in her last days of life. And after her demise, there was no question of Frank's existence in my life. I didn't even meet him after my Mom's funeral, though he was still living in my Mom's house. He became a matter of concern for me when I found him sitting with my wife Jenny, with his arms wrapped around her. It wasn't a friendly or elderly embrace. I didn't like the body language, or rather, I should say their chemistry. It was also weird because of our family dynamics. Like I mentioned, I was never close to my stepdad, and neither was Jenny close to him. So seeing such kind of comfort between them was very uncomfortable for me. I was in my car, and they were sitting in a roadside cafe. I had left the office early that day to meet one of my old friends. The place where I saw them is far from our house, and even my office. I usually don't go to that area. I went to meet my friend, but I was distracted most of the time. My friend kept asking me if something was bothering me. I just said it was about impending work. How do I tell him what I saw on my way? I went home and didn't think, but confronted Jenny about seeing her with Frank. She turned pale and was lost for words. Then she was like, yeah, I met him for lunch. I asked her why all of a sudden. She said she bumped into him and then he offered to have lunch together. The way I was staring at her, she understood that I had seen something which I shouldn't have. She said, your stepdad was really upset about losing your mom. I was trying to console him. The poor old man is lonely, and he has no one to talk to. That's why he held my hands while expressing his grief. You see, I didn't tell her I saw him holding her hands. I saw him wrapping his arms around her, and the way they were talking didn't look like he was sad or mourning for my mom. They were not laughing, but their body language was flirtatious. I didn't say anything, but I didn't buy her excuse. I decided to investigate the matter by myself before any further confrontation. Jenny is a nail artist at a beauty salon, so she works on weekends and has offs on weekdays. It was never a matter of concern between us until recently. When Jenny used to be too occupied with her work, we started to have regular fights about this. She was not giving time to our relationship and started fighting back that I was being needy after my mom's demise. She said that earlier I used to visit my mom twice a week, so Jenny's absence didn't bother me so much. She's wrong. I used to visit my mother on weekends and on those when Jenny had work. On her off days, I always ensured to return home on time to spend time with her. Previously, she used to fight that I was a mama's boy, and now she was saying I was needy. While all of this was still going on, I saw her with my stepdad, and it added to my fury. A few weeks later, it was Thanksgiving. Yes, I'm talking about this last Thanksgiving. She insisted that we invite Frank over. I was surprised at her direct suggestion. She said Frank was living alone, and had no one so as an extended family we should invite him. I told her that she never invited them when my mom was alive, but she said, Yeah, because they had each other to celebrate, but now the poor old man is alone. Ultimately, I gave in. I actually wanted to see how they behaved in front of me. 
I wouldn't say they were normal because now they know the truth, but they didn't do anything that would have caused suspicion if I didn't know the truth. I was silent for most of the time. I was never fond of him and my suspicions about him made me resent his presence. I felt he also understood that I did not like it. Overall, it was an awkward dinner with both of us eating silently and Jenny trying to break the silence with some stupid topic only to get fake smiles from both of us. It was getting very difficult for me to live with a heavy heart, so I decided to investigate. I thought of checking Jenny's phone, but that didn't work because her phone was locked and I didn't want to ask for the password because she would get suspicious. So I came up with another plan. I told Jenny that I would be going out of town for a couple of days for work. On that supposed day, I left home early and went to my office normally, but before that I planted a GPS device in Jenny's car, and I tracked it remotely. Just before the afternoon, Jenny drove to Frank's place. I wanted to catch her red-handed, but I worried that if I showed up they might just be sitting and chatting. It would be like making a fool of myself. So I asked my friend Mike for help. I told him about my suspicion and requested him to visit Frank's house. It was a very safe plan. I told Mike to record them if he found them doing anything suspicious. The house lock had a password I knew, and I was just hoping Frank hadn't changed it. Mike was worried that Frank might suspect him of sneaking into the house, but I told him to say the front door was open and he just wanted to check on him. The main door didn't open directly into the living area. There was a small passage that led into the living room, so no one would suspect him of unlocking the door. After a lot convincing, Mike agreed. He went inside but couldn't find them anywhere, so he peeked inside the bedroom with his phone camera on. He kept it in his shirt pocket with the camera sticking out so they wouldn't notice. He saw Jenny and Frank naked and cuddling each other. Mike said sorry and rushed out of the house before they realized what happened. Frank followed him outside asking what he was doing there. Mike said he just wanted to check on Frank, but that it was okay, he'd come back later. He got in his car and drove off before any confrontation. But that idiot Mike, instead of using the back camera, his front camera was on the whole time. So nothing got recorded except Frank and Jenny yelling when Mike appeared. Anyway, I got the confirmation that I needed. I had already packed two sets of clothes and toiletries before leaving that day, so I went to Mike's house. His wife was at her parents, so he insisted I stay with him until I got this all sorted out. Jenny knew Mike would tell me the truth. She messaged me asking when I was coming home, but I didn't reply. I ghosted her. She's been calling and texting endlessly. She thinks I'm still out of town for work. This all happened four days ago. I contacted a lawyer online since I don't want to see Jenny's face ever again. I'm going to serve her divorce papers and get her evicted. Yeah, I caught them cuddling all right. And it's weird Jenny asked to spend Thanksgiving with Frank. I'm sorry, it seems like your instincts were right about him. It took 10 days for the lawyer to prepare the divorce papers. Jenny was not ready to sign them and wanted to talk about it. My lawyer suggested we try for an out-of-court settlement to save time and money, since I don't have unlimited funds or time off work to do a long court battle. Since I work in sales, I have a decent but still limited income. I agreed to meet with Jenny if my lawyer was also present. But when I went for the meeting, Jenny insisted we talk in private first. I didn't want to, but my lawyer suggested I hear her out, but not to agree to anything or get manipulated. He laid out rules. No touching, no hugging or confessions from her aloud. I felt disgusted being so close to Jenny. She tried to hug me, but I pushed her away. She said it was all a misunderstanding. After reading so many cheating stories on Reddit, I know it's always just a misunderstanding. I said, yeah, sure, you were just trying to help out that poor lonely old man. She said, whatever Mike saw was true, and I wouldn't deny it but it was only cuddling, nothing else. Yes, of course, naked cuddling, but that wasn't the most shocking part. What she said next blew my mind. She screwing Frank was to safeguard her future. How the hell could betraying me safeguard her future? She said, so your mom left all her wealth to Frank, and if he married someone else, that woman would get it instead of you. 
the family property would go to a stranger. I did what I did so that I could become your stepmother and keep the inheritance. I was stunned. So you had sex with my stepdad to eventually become my stepmom and take my mom's money. The whole thing was insane. I felt dizzy from her nonsense and excuses, so I just walked out. When I returned, my lawyer asked what she said. I told him everything, and he laughed for a moment, but was also very interested to know about my mother's inheritance. It turned out my mom's house was worth over a million dollars. She inherited it from her uncle. Jenny always had her eye on it after we married, and even insisted we move in there, but I wanted my mom to stay. Jenny wanted my mom to move out into my small apartment while we took the big house. But I refused. It was my mom's, and she shouldn't have to leave. This caused fights between me and Jenny frequently. So one day I lied that my mom had given the house to Frank in her will so Jenny would drop it. Well, I paid the price for that lie. Jenny went after Frank thinking she'd eventually get the house. There was one thing she didn't know, however. After my mom died, I never put the house in my name. I wanted Frank to live there, but transferring ownership is expensive and I couldn't afford it then. I'm glad I didn't put it in my name or else Jenny would be entitled to half of it in the divorce. Who knows, maybe she wouldn't have seduced Frank if she knew I would inherit it. But a cheater will cheat no matter what. Yet my mom left that mansion to me, but Jenny thought Frank owned it. Jenny wanted me to think twice about the divorce. She said she would get Frank to sign over the deed to her, and if we stayed married, the mansion would be ours. I laughed at her proposal and declined her kind offer. She smirked and said I was losing a lot in this divorce. I smiled and said, I don't care. I don't think she actually believed I would go through with divorcing her. Jenny knew I didn't have much money except our joint savings account that would get split in the proceedings. I'm feeling so relieved now that the divorce is finalized. If she ever learns the truth about that deed, she would have never divorced me probably. Jenny dug her own grave by confessing why she seduced Frank. I was going to use that to drive them apart, but didn't need to after all. I saw Frank driving Jenny around during the divorce, assisting with legal matters. I was waiting to burst Jenny's bubble after the papers were signed. Update. I thought this whole drama was over, but my past came back to haunt me as soon as I transferred ownership of the mansion into my name. God knows what Jenny's obsession was with that house. I mean, sure, it's understandable to want a million-dollar property for yourself, but even after six months post-divorce, she wouldn't accept reality. I decided to finally put the mansion in my name. As I explained earlier, I didn't do it right away because I was short on cash at the time. But with my expenses reduced after the split, I saved up enough for all the fees. I let Frank know about my decision when I started the process a few months before. He had moved out shortly after finding out about Jenny's true motives. I didn't make him leave, but he took his things and left on his own after that. Frank made me an admin on the smart lock system and said I could come get his last remaining stuff whenever I wanted. It took a couple months for all the ownership paperwork go to through. Meanwhile, I got the place painted and cleaned up the messy lawn and pool since no one had maintained anything for a while. On one of the cleaning days, the manager called me. He said a woman just showed up and was wandering around inside the house. I wasn't there myself when it happened. They tried to stop her from entering, but she claimed to be my wife. But by the way, she was feeling the walls and staring around at everything they could tell she wasn't supposed to be there. Indeed, Jenny was not welcome there. I told them to kick her out and that I didn't have a wife anymore. They did as I asked and called me back to confirm the crazy lady had left. No prizes for guessing who showed up at my apartment next. Yes, Jenny came by crying and wailing that I had abandoned her when she did no wrong, and her intentions were pure. I told her to get therapy and check herself into a mental hospital instead of stalking me at my home. She wanted me to let her inside to talk, but no way was that happening. I shut the door in her face. Last month, I finally decided to rent the mansion out to a nice family. At first I considered moving in there myself to save money on rent, but doing the math, the potential rental income was way more than what I pay for my small apartment. 
and that giant house is too much space for just me anyhow. If I meet someone and have kids then sure, we'll move in. But no prospects at the moment, so rental it is. Oh, and I also took out a restraining order barring Jenny from the mansion property. She hadn't done anything violent, yet, but I don't trust her and wanted my tenants to feel secure. So far so good on that front. I hope I never have to update this wild saga again. I want Jenny's chapter in my life story to end for good so I can move on. Story 2 When I look back on how my marriage of 10 years ended, part of me still can't believe it actually happened. I genuinely never expected things to unfold the way they did between me and my wife Sierra. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I first met Sierra back when I started a new corporate job in the marketing department at a large company. At 29 years old and freshly divorced, I was focused on advancing my career and getting my life back on track. Sierra was clever and beautiful, working as an account executive at our ad agency partner. We get it off immediately and soon were dating. Within two years we got married in an extravagant destination wedding. I spared no expense because Sierra made me happier than I'd ever felt. The next several years we built a comfortable life together. Sierra got promoted to senior account manager while I climbed the ranks to marketing director. We weren't rich but made decent money, owned a nice home, took exotic vacations. On the surface, everything seemed great. Behind closed doors, the truth was less rosy. The sparks slowly faded from our relationship. Sierra traveled a lot for work while I put in longer hours at the office. We still cared deeply for each other, but grew apart physically and emotionally. For months, communication became strained. Sierra constantly complained I was married to my job instead of her. I tried tuning her out, assuming it was normal marriage stuff. Meanwhile, my co-worker Mia was going through her own relationship troubles that mirrored mine. Over happy hour drinks, we would vent and console each other. A close friendship formed, though I naively didn't realize Mia secretly had feelings for me. Sierra teased that Mia had a crush, but I laughed it off. I was blind to what was developing right under my nose. Things came to a head one weekend when Sierra said she was going on a girl's trip, but her social media revealed she was actually at a beach resort on and on with her boss Charles. When confronted via text, Sierra admitted it was a work conference they attended to land a big client. She told me I was paranoid and needed to trust her. I wanted to believe Sierra, but alarm bells were blaring by then. In an emotional confrontation when Sierra returned, I issued an ultimatum. She needed to quit that job or we were over. Sierra refused, saying I was controlling and she shouldn't have to choose. But I was adamant. Charles was recently divorced too. I told her bluntly that I didn't trust this guy's intentions with my wife. End of story. We bitterly fought into the night before I moved to the guest room. When Sierra left the next morning, looking full as my suspicions deepened. I still regret what I did, but something in me snapped. While Sierra was gone, I snooped through her phone, finding provocative texts between her and Charles over the last six months. My heart shattered reading their plans to run off together, calling me a clueless nitwit. I saw Red envisioning my wife in bed with her smarmy boss. Without thinking, I began packing Sierra's belongings into suitcases and boxes. I then placed an emergency call to my brother James, asking him to come immediately. My panicked voice freaked James out, but he could tell I was on the edge. He promised to get there as fast as he could. Pacing my house fuming with rage, I almost felt an out-of-body experience unfolding. Sierra had mocked me, the fool duped by his cheating wife. I was already humiliated imagining everyone's reactions once the affair got exposed. Sierra and Charles sneaking around whispering about poor clueless me. I refused to let Sierra betray and embarrass me any longer. She needed to face consequences for what she'd done. When Sierra returned hours later, she startled seeing James' truck parked outside. Her smug expression morphed to alarm as she entered our bedroom and flipped the light switch. Surprise, I shouted bitterly. Sierra's designer bags and favorite possessions were cleared from the closet. The open suitcases and boxes on the bed drove home the dark revelation. I knew the sordid truth. What? What are you doing? 
Sierra stuttered, face draining of color. She swayed unsteadily, like she might pass out. I strode aggressively toward Sierra, making her retreat against the wall. I should ask what Love you UV been doing, or actually who. Sierra just kept shaking her head, mumbling no, no, no. I laughed harshly. Did you think I was blind, Sierra? That I wouldn't uncover your dirty affair with Charles eventually. Hot tears spilled down Sierra's cheeks though she remained silent. Well now the proof is undeniable. The love of your life is waiting downstairs actually. Go run away with him like you planned. I stepped aside pointing at the door. Sierra peered tentatively into the hallway before seeing Charles hovering there uncomfortably. Sierra wailed, oh God, before crumpling to the floor in the dead faint. I watched her fall with a mixture of dark satisfaction and sadness for what we lost. The woman passed out before me was stranger now. My wife, my best friend, my lover. All of that felt like a lifetime ago. I strode silently past my brother downstairs, emotionally drained but resolved. The worst was over. Sierra, Sierra, wake up. I heard Charles pleading as he tapped Sierra's face, trying reviving her limp body sprawled on the bedroom carpet. Her eyelids eventually fluttered open with the dazed expressions. Sierra's gaze bounced wildly between Charles and I looming over her until clarity hit. She sucked in a sharp breath and scuttled backwards. Why are you here, Charles? Sierra whispered. Did you tell him? Charles held up his palms helplessly. Before he could respond, I cut in slightly. Oh, Charles didn't have to tell me anything, honey. Your sloppy digital trail gave away plenty. But I wanted the big reveal to really sink in, so I flew at your boyfriend as a surprise. Sierra cleared her throat, head bowed contritely. Jackson, I'm... I'm so sorry. Please let me explain everything. Her voice shook with emotion. I crouched down beside Sierra, tipping her chin to meet my eyes. Don't apologize to me anymore. I'm done. Just be with Charles openly now, like you've apparently wanted for a while. No more lies or hiding. Sierra shook her head adamantly. No, Jackson, you've got this all wrong. Charles means nothing to me. It was just a foolish mistake. You have to believe me. You and this life we've built together are everything I could want. I smiled ruefully, patting her hand. Come on, Sierra, give me some credit here. I'm not an idiot. The racy texts, secret getaways, it was only a matter of time before you two left me in the dust. I'm simply expediting the inevitable. Charles stepped forward, pleading Jackson, listen. I dissolved whatever was starting between Sierra and I as soon as you contacted me. I had no idea she was married. He glared accusingly at Sierra. You told me your divorce was almost finalized. Clearly nothing justifies what I did, but please know I ended this immediately out of respect for your marriage. I stood up sighing, suddenly exhausted by their excuses and lies. Just save a dude. Sierra orchestrated this whole charade top to bottom. She's the one who stood before our friends and families promising fidelity and loyalty. Frankly, I don't give a damn about either of you anymore. Now if you'll excuse me, I'd like you both to get the hell out of my bedroom. I left a sputtering Sierra and sheepish Charles behind, directing my brother James to show them out. Downing a stiff drink in relief, I knew the worst confrontation was behind me finally. Sierra clearly respected only power moves by involving Charles. Now they could bask in the wreckage together. Soon I heard the front door close signaling Sierra and Charles gone. James squeezed my shoulder compassionately. That couldn't have been easy, brother. But you took control, and I'm proud of you. Sierra doesn't deserve your heart if she treats it so carelessly. There are good women still out there when you're ready. I smiled gratefully. Thanks, James, for the advice and just being here. Witnessing their reactions when it all clicked was priceless. Sierra forgot who she was dealing with. We clinked glasses as I toasted new beginnings ahead. I was through shedding tears over Sierra's betrayal. With closure finally achieved, my thoughts turned happily towards sweet revenge instead. Over the next week, I dodged continuous calls and texts from Sierra trying to get me to reconsider. She swung rapidly between tearful pleading. 
angrily blaming me for pushing her away and attempting to appeal to my sympathy. But I refused to engage. Only through James would I learn Sierra was staying on a friend's couch, unwilling to move in with Charles yet. That gave me a spark of satisfaction despite everything. I wasn't going to make concessions to a cheating woman, so I filed for divorce. I didn't want that kind of marriage. Update. The divorce was nearly finalized, separating assets fairly amicably, all things considered. Sierra moved cities, accepting a new executive position with less baggage. A fresh start for her career and relationships. We exchanged occasional polite check-ins, but kept appropriate distance emotionally. I felt ready to close that chapter and look ahead. Being on my own took some adjusting to, but I enjoyed regaining independence. I reconnected with old friends, hit the gym regularly distressing, even rediscovered passion for hobbies like photography. One Saturday, I wandered through a street festival downtown snapping pictures. Focused on framing an interesting graffiti mural, I accidentally bumped right into someone. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. The woman I collided with exclaimed. I glanced up from my camera giggling. No, no, it was totally my fault. I was off in the zone here. The pretty brunette woman grinned back sheepishly, and we apologized over each other for a minute. Hey, want me to take a picture of you in front of the mural? I offered. Her face lit up. That would be great, thanks. She posed playfully a few times while I snapped some shots. Let me see how they turned out. She leaned in close to peer at the camera display, and I caught a whiff of her pleasant floral perfume. These look fabulous. You've got a good eye, she prays. I suddenly felt almost shy at her proximity and flushed a bit. Oh, I'm Kate, by the way, she added, extending her hand which I shook, feeling a little spark of electricity. Jackson, nice to meet you, Kate. Her eyes crinkled warmly and lingered on mine. An awkward silence stretched before I cleared my throat. Well, I should let you get back to enjoying the festival. Wait, Kate interjected as I began veering away. She bit her lip hesitantly. Would you maybe want to walk around together? Unless you have someone else here. I smiled, feeling strangely drawn to this bubbly stranger fate knocked into my path today. No, nope, just me, shall we? Kate beamed, looping her arm through mine. As we meandered, taking in street performers and artsy booths, the conversation flowed so naturally it felt like reuniting with an old friend. I learned Kate managed a non-profit arts program and had just moved here several months before for work. In return, I found myself opening up about my career, my passion for photography, how cathartic starting over in my hometown felt post-divorce. Kate and Pry but listened intently, interjecting thoughtful questions and funny commentary that kept making me laugh. At some point our hands entwined subconsciously. The afternoon rush left me feeling giddy and electrified when we finally parted ways. I couldn't remember connecting so quickly with someone before. I called Kate the very next evening to invite her out to dinner, and she happily accepted. One unforgettable date led to more, until we were spending every free moment together, blissfully happy. Six months later, the vibrant, big-hearted girl who literally collided into my world that fateful afternoon moved into my place. Music